Um, <coughs> so good morning, and um, I hope you're enjoying the middle of your um, weekend uh, here at Tel Aviv University. Uh, my name is Ishai Blank, and I'm the Associate Dean for Academic um, Matters um, Affairs. Uh, and I welcome all of you um, to the to the fifth uh, Berg International Conference um, on the Arts in Legal History. Um, so it's especially thrilling to see so many familiar faces and also some newer faces here, um, at least for me. Um, I first of all would like to, um, um, to really thank uh, Roy Kreitner, Chris Tomlins, and Anat Rosenberg for organizing this really thrilling uh, conference. Um, I was just looking at the, at the program a few days ago, um, and I couldn't make up my mind uh, which at least seemed more promising, interesting, and fascinating, and I would really like to join um, as many of the panels. I'm not sure I will be able to, but at least um, as many as possible. Um, I don't want to take uh, much time, um, and I think we have quite um, a few full days um, to uh, spend together. Um, so again, let me just um, thank everyone, and also to thank uh, Sefi for her wonderful administrative um, assistance in organizing this. Um, She's not here. <laughs> yeah, but, but we can show her that we actually really thanked her. Um, so um, now um, I call uh, Professor Neely Cohen to. Oh, Asaf wants to talk first. Uh, Roy asked me, so I'll just say uh, a So uh, I'm the director of the Berg Institute, so. Uh, I'm uh, administratively responsible for this conference. But actually, I didn't do anything. It was the three organizers who I also want to thank, Anat, Ray, and Chris. Uh, I think this uh, is one, it's a really impressive uh, conference. And having read the papers, I, I know that it will also be, I know that uh, it will be published, ultimately be published. And I think it will be a really major contribution uh, to the study of legal history. So I'm very glad uh, that all of you are here. Uh, I should also send Sefi, my very able uh, assistant. Um, one uh, or two t small technical points. First of all, we are recording this on video for posterity. Um, for when history. The, for history. So when the speakers speak, it's not a problem. There are uh, microphones, but uh, uh, at during question time, unfortunately, yeah, there's a, uh, this room has still not been totally upgraded. Uh, um, for a real audiovisual experience, so we have this microphone that we'll have to pass around the table, and anybody who, who is asking a question is kindly requested to use the microphone. So uh, you also need to talk to it. Yeah, actually. Uh, <laughs> Just one, one thing about that, when you talk into this, don't expect your voice to be amplified. It's not, it's not, uh, yeah. it's not, it's only a recording right. device. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, secondly, uh, there are two days here at Tel Aviv, the third day, is a tour of Jerusalem, especially for those who's been, who have been warriors for the first time. Uh, Sefi asked uh, you whether you want to join the tour or not. Uh, <coughs> just to make sure, please let her know again if you're uh, going on a tour or not. I think it will be a very interesting experience. Some people are, will be un unable to do it. But uh, for those who are staying here in Israel third day, I think it will be interesting. So just let Sefi <coughs> know about uh, uh, your intentions, whether you want to join or not. So, thank you all uh, again for, for being here. And, uh, Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm really happy to open the first session of this uh, fascinating uh, conference in a fascinating uh, session. And uh, I was told by the organizers of the conference that a time schedule will be as follows. Uh, the speaker is going to speak for 15 minutes, the commentator, uh, I see that nobody uh, Leora, told nobody told us. So, well. So, and the commentator uh, will follow by by a talk of uh, ten minutes, and then we'll have a fruitful debate. So, um, the first speaker <coughs> is uh, Ayelet Benishai. Uh, of the University of Haifa, an expert in English literature and also a lawyer. She will talk on the presumption of legal culture. Please, Ayelet. Um, 
Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Um, despite the somewhat cosmic irony of the fact that finally there's a conference in Israel and I'm still jet lagged for it, right? <laughs> but um, I came back from sabbatical, I think something like 24 hours ago, but I'm not sure. Um, um, okay. I'm, what I, what I, I was wondering in, in this introduction whether I should summarize for those who read long ago or maybe just skimmed or maybe did not read at all, and then or whether I should um, sort of contextualize and talk about um, the theoretical things. And then I decided to go for an unhappy a medium in which I try to do a little bit of both. Um, and mainly what I'm going to try and do is point out the questions that I find most interesting in my own work. Um, and the questions that I ask in this paper stem from sort of the larger picture of this, stem from three theoretical questions which, with which I've been grappling in various forms and which promise to continue challenging me at least in the foreseeable future. So those three big questions are questions of epistemology, how we know, who, and who we are when we know in these ways, right? So how do we know things and what does that say about the we that is constituted by a certain form of knowing? More specifically, I'm interested in the epistemology of literary realism, um, a genre um, which is often derided for its unsophisticated empiricism, its very um, naive way of thinking about reality, and we'll get to that, I'll get to that again later. Um, the um, the second, no, 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 um, the second, um, the second overarching concern um, is with common and communal modes of meaning and meaning making, right? So I'm interested in the way meaning is made as part of a collective endeavor, and again, I'll talk about that um, um, as well. And the third is what I hear call legal culture, though I use it kind of differently than it is usually used in, the, in literature, and I'll get to that at the end. And more specifically, the relationship between law and literature, and more widely, of course, in terms of our conference, law and the arts. Um, and I'll get to that at the end of my um, brief introduction. In any way, in this brief introduction, as I said, I will show how a law and literature study of the presumption of legitimacy in the Victorian period offers an interventions into the way we think of each of these three concerns, epistemology, communal modes of meaning making, and legal culture, and the way also those three relate to each other. As I hope is, is apparent to those who have read the paper, I'm more interested in the nature and structure of presumption than in, than more interested in the, in the presumption part rather than the illegitimacy part. Not because illegitimacy is not interesting, I think it's, an, it's a fascinating interdisciplinary nexus, but others before me have addressed its centrality to regulating and reifying Victorian and also other periods, social, economic, and cultural concerns, and there's some citations in my article. Um, so people have done that and done it very well, I think. My own work on the realist novel, I inquire into how Victorians knew themselves and the forms in which this knowledge was conceived. I thus address the presumption of le legitimacy not to inquire into the status of illegitimate children or the consequences of being one, nor to trace its historical developments, but rather to ask the epistemological questions that the presumption raises, questions that I think undergird the way Victorians knew and understood their world. It is also my contention here and elsewhere, and this is key to understanding my point, that many of these ways in which Victorians knew and understood their world were conventional. Um, social constructs, since you will, right? They're, they're socially constructed and hence commonly constructed, right? So that these are ways, these are conventions that are part of a communal um, mode of understanding and of making meaning. Thus, the nature of conventionality, right, which is the intersect. So, as I understand it, convention conventionality is an intersection of the communal and epistemological, right? So, what is a convention? A convention is a communal way of under of 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 of, of knowing, right? 
Indeed, one could argue, uh, so the nature of conventionality is at the center of my paper. And indeed, one could argue that I've firmly staked my career to date on the belief that the most interesting, if undervalued, aspect of the realist novel is its conventionality. Right? That it's taken for grantedness or its commitment to the normal mode of things is where it gets exciting. So, legal, social, and cultural conventions, as I see them, are inherently common and collective. They need a group, a commonality to convene, right? To see together or to come together, um, to convene. But I want to be clear that here and other places when referring to commonality, I do not mean an existing delineated common identity, but rather the search for one and the anxiety over its elusiveness. So I distinguish it from community, which tends to be more stable, smaller, and knowable. So when we're talking about a community, we tend to talk about something that is finite, or at least we understand it to be finite. Okay, a smaller in scale, which also implies personal knowledge of all or most of its members, or at least generates a totality which can be labeled as known. In contrast, a commonality is almost infinitely extensible and thus more contingent and diffuse than community. As a result, it cannot be known or named in its totality, right? So when we talk about commonality, we can't say the commonality of scholars of law or even of you know university professors or whatever commonality one feels part of um, so it's it's ex excuse me it's extensible and contingent and diffuse right as a result it cannot be known or named it's in totality I've said that like the publics described by Michael Warner in his um, seminal article a commonality and I'm quoting from Warner differs from nations races professions or any other groups that saturate identity it is self-organizing a kind of entity created by its own discourse and always in excess of its known social basis end quote most specifically, commonality here in my work denotes an epistemological community, a collective of minds that knows the real world, whatever that may be, in similar ways, whatever those may be, and that works through the accretion of social connections. It is held up by its ability to hold intention and engage both the imminent and constructed qualities of the real that gives its name to realism. This last part is less important. So it is, a part, it is part of the nature of conventionality, I contend, that makes it invisible. Like ideology, it is the purloined letter, everywhere in plain sight, understood by everyone. But because it's so in plain sight and understood by everyone, we never stop to describe it or think about it. But some writers, I think, and often those dismissed as unexciting or conventional, have the ability to defamiliarize the very conventionality they deploy and to open it up for scrutiny. I have found the novels of Anthony Trollope, to which I seem destined to return again and again, um, but I found those novels to, of Anthony Trollope to be especially good at doing so, sort of defamiliarizing the conventional. Indeed, as Ramon Zaldivar has noted, um, Trollope deploys his realism, quote, not so much to signify Victorian England as to represent certain of Victorian England's ways of signifying itself, end quote. Indeed, in his work, I'm quoting again, Trollope often seems interested not so much in reality as in the Victorian conventions of representing reality, which is basically what I've been saying. I argue that the details in realist fiction, then, are not clues to a latent or absent reality, but function as reality itself, the reality of what is commonly accepted as real. The reality of realist fiction is thus in itself an aggregate or a concentrate of mutually, if implicitly agreed on, agreed upon assumptions, homologous in many ways to the structure of legal presumption. Indeed, as I show in the paper, presumption is not an abstract or universal form or rule, but one whose epistemology is in itself conventionally and historically determined and in dialogue with other Victorian conventions of knowing an ever-shifting world and most prominently the realist novel. Reading the novel in this way allows us not only to understand legal conventions alongside literary conventions, but to understand the social and cultural work of conventionality itself. So, what are the payoffs, I hope, or 
what are the payoffs that I hope are in this kind of research or in my work. One is I move from the questions of individual identity and legitimacy, which are the focus of most scholarship on um, illegitimacy, right? So the idea of who, who uh, what individual is, right? It's an individual as um, legitimate or illegitimate part or outside all those questions, to understanding legitimacy and illegitimacy as a collective epistemological enterprise, a common assuaging of social doubt, right? It's a way of coming together to assuage social doubt. Rethinking the, re okay, so that's one thing. Second thing, re rethinking the relationship between realism and doubt, in which realism becomes a way to interrogate doubt and the way in which it is assuaged, denied, worried, or otherwise dealt with, even when, or especially when, it is implicit and not explicit. In my close readings of the novel, and we can talk about that later in Q&A, um, I show how the presumption of, I mean, talk about the way close readings as a methodology works. Um, to create these arguments. Um, anyway, in my close readings, I show that the presumption of legitimacy undergoes a series of almost imperceptible shifts between the characters and as throughout the novel. These shifts betray the slippery foundation on which the questions of status stand, even in this highly conservative novel. So the novel is where very conservative and very um, invested in questions of status, but at the same time, it's also uncannily good at describing how slippery status is and how unstable it is. These shifts betray this, uh, they also point to an obvious, these shifts point to an obvious but often undervalued fact, that the normative world is no less in flux than the social world it aims to govern. Moreover, and most importantly, their interface, the ways in which the social and the normative interact and depend on each other shifts at the same time as it's doing so, right? So not only is the social world in flux and the normative world is in flux, the way they relate to each other also shifts throughout this period. So there's a historical shift in the way they relate to each other. And I think that's something that we tend to um, not think enough about um, when working um, with law and literature. As others have argued before me, realism does not presume our ability, this is the final stake, right? As others have argued before me, realism does not presume our ability to know the real, but rather in an insistence on doing so in varied forms, troubles these very presumptions. In placing the legal presumption of legitimacy at the center of its plot, in contemplating it with another point raising questions of fidelity and trust, in having the two complicate each other and yet be ultimately immaterial, Trollope interrogates the very culture of presumption, what we assume about the world to make it knowable. So I now end with the stakes of these arguments for the study of law and the arts. And here I'm just basically quoting myself from the last um, two pages of, of, my, um, of my paper. So what are, the, what are the stakes of these arguments for the study of law and the arts? One, I think it's an exhortation, my work is an exhortation to work with legal plurality and historical specificity rather than transcendent universals or principles in order to produce a messy complexity rather than a neat abstraction. Legal and social plurality is endemic to the constructions of marriage and illegitimacy, as I show in, the, in, in my readings. Indeed, the novel gives us a sample of just how complicated and consequential that plurality can be. But I want to stress here that my point is not to argue that literature is a privileged form that can make apparent legal pluralism, nor that it has a special insight in the stakes of this plurality. In fact, I take great issue with such legal handmade approaches to literature, which romanticize literature's ability to integrate that which is overlooked, marginalized, or otherwise excluded from the narrower, yet more important, confines of the law. The legal presumption of illegitimacy is, after all, a convention. It's neither narrow nor wide, as is the form of realist fiction. Rather, both these conventions offer a way to, get, to engage with reality, whatever it may mean, in a way that is pragmatically motivated as it is idealistic. Most importantly, both of these conventions were also ways to engage with the very nature of conventionality, I think I've made that clear by now, which was at stake in the Victorian period. The as if which undergirds realist fiction, right? We're, we're not writing about reality, but we're writing as if. Um, 
and is akin to legal presumption is also a social epistemological strategy, a way of making the world knowable, stable, and common. Both legal and fictional constructs are communally sanctioned ways of mediating between a constantly shifting reality that was radically unknowable and the paradoxical and pragmatic need to know it. What this makes clear is that the law is not a separate sphere of influence, sphere, huh, it's not a separate sphere of influence, but one which is a necessary and inextricable part of the reality both author and his characters inhabit. The law can no longer be considered simply as a set of rules and, and decisions, but a living dynamic construct containing disparate entities in varying degrees of tension with each other, one which I here call legal culture. Legal culture in this view is not um, not only plural and dynamic, as I've already claimed, but also attendant to the ways these pluralities interact. In this understanding, literature neither reflects legal culture nor stands in contrast to it. Rather, these two practices participate in what Ewick and Sibley call, quote, the mediating process through which social interactions and local processes aggregate and condense into institutional and powerful structures, end quote. Trollope, I argue, not only understands legal part culture, but participates in it. His fiction does not or not only represent or critique the law, but is an active agent in the British legal culture of the mid-Victorian period. Reading Trollope and other realist writing was one of the ways in which Victorians participated in constructing a common epistemology for their time. Following and questioning common law's legal presumption was another. And for us today, Reading Victorian realism and presumptions together, I think, enables a complex understanding of the historically specific ways a culture understood what reality was and how it could be known. <laughs>